even knew what day these mock terrorists were coming to try to, to do these drills. So uh, the Department of Energy made the decision that the the largest quantities of nuclear material should be removed from Livermore, and this was at Tri Valley Cares. We worked really hard to push them to make this decision, and we won it. And in 2012, they moved all bomb usable quantities of special nuclear material off site. They moved it to sites where they have better security. I mean, we were hoping they would take it out of the programmatic work, but and they did with some of it, but most of it ended up going back to Los Alamos. Some went to uh, WIP, which is a waste treatment facility in New Mexico. Um, but it can truthfully be made safer at those sites. Lo uh, Los Alamos is 45 square miles, not one. It uh, has, uh, it's easier to make safe there. So it, it's, we saw, saw it as a victory. It also hampers the ability of scientists at Livermore Lab to do nuclear weapons <coughs> research. And that's a good thing. We'd like to move Livermore Lab out of nuclear weapons, shrink the complex, not spend as much money, not have all these brilliant people working on these things, shift them to things that are more important priorities. Um, but at, now, even though we had this victory, now at the bequest of scientists at the lab, under one program, they're trying to bring back plutonium bomb cores from Los Alamos, the same plutonium that we got removed, it's up to six times a year. They want to take uh, bomb cores and ship them on trucks to Livermore, do environmental testing on them, which means shaking them, baking them, and um, dropping them in a drop test. This would all be to test a use environment on modified nuclear weapons, uh, and then ship those plutonium pits back to Los Alamos. And they've urged us that when they do this, they will somehow wave a magic wand over Livermore Lab, and it will have adequate security while the those cores are there, and then they'll bring them back to Los Alamos. Then there's going to be minimal impacts, minimal dangers to um, health, and we shouldn't be worried. Well, we're worried. Um, so we have a petition going on. We've had meetings uh, in the community. They, at our, um, because we've whined about it, they're going to do an environmental review, um, and so there will be a public process. Um, but the petition is really helpful because we go to Congress in April and we go have meetings at the Department of Energy and we'll take this petition with us. We've already got about a thousand signatures, plus it's online now. Um, but if you guys would sign it here, that would be helpful because it's nice to not just have people in Livermore signing it, but to have people in, else, in other communities say, well, we're worried about this too, um, especially because it's going to be going on the road 1,100 miles uh, multiple times per year. So um, I brought that petition. It's also a worry because having plutonium on site is going to put the workers back at risk at this site where we know it can't be made safe. So it does have a, a worker aspect to it too. So, so that's my, my talk and I will pass this around to you guys, but I wanted to see if you had any questions about anything I've said. Um, sure. An old friend of mine wrote the first, uh, wrote an article, published an article in Esquire in May or June of 1969 called Please don't steal the atomic bomb. And I have a copy somewhere. It's sort of hard to find. And uh, he, he's in New York in 1969, and he, he uh, you know, he just walked into a facility. I, you know, it's just, that's what the story was about. It was somewhere near Buffalo, New York. Alan Adelson. Well, you may have heard it that that. I don't know if that was the first article of this kind. I think it was. It, yeah, it very. I haven't heard of this issue going back that long, so that's interesting. Yeah, I think people think it's more of a contemporary post 9/11 issue, but it's really not. And um, you might know too that some plowshares protesters, uh, including an 82-year-old nun, were able to cut the fence and uh, get on site at the Y12 nuclear facility in Tennessee. Um, and they made it all the way into the high secure area one night and were able to be there for like 45 minutes before security got to them. The point of that demonstration or that action was to bring attention to nuclear weapons work and, and you know, I think that's what they were thinking about. The effect of that has actually been amazing and really different. Um, the Department of Energy has had to Congress was very upset, lots of people are very upset that this happened, and they've had to go back and do major reevaluation of some of their programmatic work that they're doing and what their current security requirements are. Um, and, you know, it's really shown that it's 
very difficult to make this material safe anywhere. And they have no answers for how they can do that. And it really brings up questions about, can we do this safely anywhere? No. Uh, I'll someone, else, let someone else take yeah. but I, I No, I just one. wanted, you, you stated a figure of $250,000 for compensation? Sure, yes. That's all? I mean, yes. what if you have liver cancer? What if you died? Yeah, I mean, yeah. and that's all the money that, that... That's much higher than the average compensation for an ordinary worker. Well, that's, isn't that tied to the tort reforms? And then well, that's, all... That's, that's, that's uh, fine. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yes, it is a, l a low amount. Um, it's tied to what they thought the average would be if you were to bring a private action around the country for these kind of worker contaminations. Um, but it's tied to what that number was in 2000. They haven't changed it since then. Um, you know, at this point, workers are happy to get anything. That one of the difficulties with the act, and one of the reasons why they created it, is because it used to be that your own worker files were classified. So if you brought private action, you did, still could not get a hold of those. <coughs> so how could you, you know, prove worker contamination without your files, without Department of Energy materials? So now that can happen in a classified setting at Department of Labor. You, I still don't get to see them when I represent people, but the Department of Labor does. We have to trust them that they're you know, accurately reading those materials and you know, doing the claimants claim justice, but it's not always possible. Yes, sir. You I'll mentioned that the, that the labs were privatized. Yes. Do these the workers actually work for a private company now? And if so, if that's what it's going on, it's just like any other corporation where they've got corners. Yes. So would you explain that process sure. to me? Do they work one of these five companies? Or? Yeah, it used to be that if you worked at Livermore Lab, your check came from University of California. Now your check comes from Lawrence Livermore National Security LLC. They work for a private company. What's really alarming about this situation is that management, quote unquote management, of the LLC, so the kind of, they just manage the contract, basically, is what they do. Since under the new contract, post Salary. University of California, salaries have gone up about four times. The um, new director of the lab now makes almost $500,000 a year. Um, he used to make one fifth of that. Um, their costs have skyrocketed. They've moved themselves out of the facility and into town because they don't even want to be on site. They want to have separation between the workers and management. Um, and you know, they they come out with something called their performance evaluation review every year. I'll just give you this example because it came out just uh, last week. We've had to get it from the Freedom of Information Act. Um, they failed. On, well, so they first they self-evaluate, and in their self-evaluation, they gave themselves excellence across the board. Well, when NNSA, the government, came in and did its own audit, they failed. They got a 78%, and according to this, that's a failure, which should mean that the contract comes up for a for review and that it can be bid out by other companies, that there should be in-depth lo looking at this contract and not what the management company is doing. But... The head of NNSA, who was, um, well, I'll get to that, that one last. The head of NNSA, whose name is Neil Miller, she um, used her own authority to increase the score high enough so that they just automatically got their um, contract. They also got another $500,000 for a total of 50, almost $50 million in bonuses. Um, this is just for the management. Just for management. Cool. And they do this process at all of the labs. Uh, Los Alamos' situation was even worse. They had 68% and also ended up passing because she just gave them the check mark, gave them millions more in cool. compensation. And she, two weeks later, was promoted for probably the exact written numbers. up in the press? And we are trying to get press for it, and, and it, it will. Yes? How is Tri Valley funded? We are funded by a mixture, um, for about 40% of our funding comes from foundation funding, um, the largest being a foundation located here in San Francisco called Plowshares Foundation or Plowshares Fund. Um, then we are about uh, another 50% of our money comes from individual donors. 
Um, we have about 5,600 members, but to be a member, you do not have to donate. Um, however, many of our members do donate you know, once a year or so, sometimes twice, and we have a few larger donors. Um, and then about 10% of our funding is from the Environmental Protection Agency because we get something called a TAG grant or Technical Assistance Grant. Um, so we monitor and engage the community in the cleanup process that's happening at the main site. And at Site 300, Livermore has an, a high explosives testing range that's in the hills beyond town. Um, that's a large facility where they do just what it sounds like. They test high explosives, so they blow stuff up out there. There's tons of depleted uranium that they've blown up out there, and it's very contaminated. And so we get to go to those sites and get to give feedback on how they're cleaning it up, what schedule they're doing it, what the standard they're doing it to is, and we make sure that the community kind of gives its approval for that. So that's where our funding is. Yes? Two, one quick question. Is this where the depleted uranium is near the Lawrence Livermore lab here, or the one down in Livermore, California? Mm -hmm. main, there's a, the main site that's in town in Livermore, and then the site where there's depleted uranium is near between Livermore and Tracy in the foothills in a more remote area, although Tracy is rapidly growing right to it. Um, but, yeah. All right. Here. The, second, the second part is, um, in terms of causality, do these uh, corporations ever openly acknowledge, officially acknowledge uh, that their the work caused this, or do they? Is it always like a settlement saying it's not our fault, but we'll pay you so much money? I mean, that's a really interesting question. The causation is a independent <coughs> doctor reviews the records that show what your contamination was at the facility and decides whether it was 50% or more likely that your illness was caused by those exposures. And they give you a percentage. So if your percentage was 44% and they acknowledge in a letter to you all the things that they think you were exposed to, they'll say beryllium and uranium and, um, plutonium. and toxic metals, yeah, potentially plutonium and asbestos, and, and the list goes on and on for the things they have there. But we don't think that caused your liver cancer because you only work there for five years or for whatever reason. They don't even give a reason. But so then you don't really, really get acknowledgement that even though you know you were exposed, you don't know that they don't agree that your cancer was caused by it. Well, what, what oh. that, if it was 54%, then what would they say? then they'd say, yes, you get compensation. Your illness was likely caused by your exposures. So they opened these or they Yeah. And one of the things that's very important to understand is that the uh, nuclear workers in Japan, many of them are contract workers. Mm. So they're not even keeping a proper registry of where these workers work. And they work in different plants all over the country. And also, when they do apply for compensation from uh, working at the plants, they only provide compensation for cancer. However, there are many other diseases that are caused by radiation. Those are not compensable. So you can get these other diseases, and you, get, get, you can't get compensation. But if it's cancer, you can prove it. But the main problem is thousands of workers, contract workers, part-time workers, day laborers in Japan, are because they don't keep proper registration, they can't even prove that they've been injured and, and sickened by working in these facilities. And as was reported earlier, the Yakuza uh, hire these day laborers in Japan, and they don't tell them anything. Uh, they, in some cases, they have lead over their dosimeters, uh, so they're covering up the contamination of these workers who are, by the thousands, working in these plants. And also, they can backtrack because once they, you know, contract out, uh, job is done, then disperse Precisely. I just want to mention too that there's actually a demonstration nuclear reactor in Pleasanton, California, which is really near Livermore. It's called GE Valacitas. Um, it is still operational, or at least one cell is. Um, and many workers worked at GE Valacitas and at Livermore Lab and have exposures from both places. Sometimes their exposures at GE Valacitas were even worse than they were at Livermore Lab. Yes? A uh, different kind of a question, but I am aware that DOE and TVA are working on a deal to recycle aged weapons material into pre fuel they call it, yeah. TVA. Yeah, uh, that's true to an extent. TVA is, is the customer that DOE is hoping to get. TVA actually has not committed to 
using a MOX reactor. MOX stands for mixed oxide radioactive fuel. So they want to take um, weapons plutonium and the, that we have a huge excess of, by the way. We have 10,000 plutonium pits sitting in Pantex. We have another 3,000 weapons awaiting dismantlement, which just means that then we take the pit and put them with the other 10,000. Is more? No, in Pantex in Texas. Oh, oh. And uh, <laughs> so we have this excess of plutonium, so one of the <coughs> these bright ideas is to make it so that we can use, down, reprocess this plutonium and then use it in uh, reactors that are built specifically to use this kind of fuel. Interestingly, one of the Fukushima reactors was a MOX reactor used to this kind of fuel, which is why there's plutonium <coughs> contamination that occurred at, uh, at Fukushima. Um, we currently do not have any power plant in the United States that's built to run on MOX fuel. To do so, they would have to either make a major um, renovation to an existing plant, which is what TBA is suggesting happen, or what the DOE is telling TBA to do, and what they've thought about. However, they recently backed out of the deal. Um, yet we are going forward and making the MOX facility at Savannah River site at the cost of about $8 billion. So we are ready, we will be ready to have MOX fuel on the market about 2020, and um, there's currently no customer, which suggests to me that we will probably uh, ship yeah. that fuel elsewhere. Japan. Maybe Japan will be the customer. Maybe France will be because they also have a MOX reactor. Oh, British. Yes. Um, do they sell plutonium to the military? Sell. Using weapons or... It's, I, I understand it's being used in weapons. It's like bunker busters to... to, to. Well, I mean, all of the plutonium is used in, in weapons that go to the military. And the DOE, is that what you meant? And um, I mean, the, all of the weapons DOE makes goes into military use. They are used in our triad of nuclear weapons, which we continually uh, maintain. We have 1,800 weapons currently or so that are on strategic deployment, which means they are on a delivery vehicle all the time and ready to be deployed all the time at a moment's notice. Most of them would reach their target in about 20 minutes. Um, we have three types of delivery vehicles in the triad, submarines, nuclear armed submarines that are always in the oceans at all times, armed and ready. Don't you we feel have safe? Intercontinental <laughs> ballistic missiles, which are ground-based weapons that are located around the country, lots in South Dakota and places like that. And then we have bombers or airplanes that are either on aircraft carriers or at military bases around the country that are also armed and ready all the time with a, a, a pilot standing nearby. So. Uh, before we go to the next question, um, we had uh, invited uh, some whistleblowers and lo a lawyer in from San Diego, Paul Garner, and to come to the conference. And for some reason, we uh, lost touch with them. And I don't know, the sailor is still in the military, so there may have been some pressure on them not to come up and speak publicly about what's going on. However, I wanted to just briefly say what happened because these uh, Tamaga uh, Tamagotchi, Tamagotchi was a pro Between the friends, uh, friends uh, was a project or an operation in Japan uh, of the nuclear uh, force of the nuclear aircraft carrier USS uh, Reagan, which was 60 miles off of uh, Fukushima, and there's 70,000 U.S. military personnel. So they went to help the people from the tsunami and to deliver supplies and that kind of thing. Uh, the the uh, sailors, however, did not have proper training on decontamination. So the uh, aircraft, helicopters and aircraft, were coming back on the aircraft carrier. They were washing them down with soap and water. And they were getting contaminated. And the, uh, uh, the head of the carrier group said that they didn't have to worry. Everything was okay because they had uh, water, you know, bottled water. So they didn't have to worry about being contaminated. What happened is, is now there are hundreds of uh, service personnel, sailors who are sick, and, and even their children, some of their children who have been born with deformities. Uh, and uh, they're suing Japan government and TEPCO. And additionally, the aircraft carrier USS Reagan is now being uh, refitted or reconditioned in the port of Bremerton, Washington. And there, it may be, uh, we've heard some stories that some of the workers, shipyard workers who are working on that uh, carrier are themselves becoming contaminated by radiation. 
in all likelihood that that aircraft carrier is going to have to be scrapped. The reason is if uh, uh, it is a nuclear aircraft carrier, which means you have to isolate where radiation is coming from in, in, a, in a carrier, in a nuclear carrier. The problem is that the carrier itself is contaminated. So they're getting radioactive readings all over the carrier, which means they won't know where a leak is coming from if there is a leak in the nuclear reactor. So this, again, has been covered up by the media in the United States. There's no information about it. Uh, it's out there, the lawsuit is out there, but it shows there's tremendous pressure to keep quiet for people, for whistleblowers and others who are being affected by this contamination. But I just wanted to explain to you why they weren't able to come. So. I want to just add real quick to that, though, that the reason that I do this work is because my dad was a worker for the nuclear Navy at Hunter's Point in San Francisco, oh, which has kind of a similar history um, where boats that were at the nuclear test in the Pacific were brought back to Hunter's Point to be decontaminated. And my dad did that work, and luckily he's okay so far. But everyone who he worked with, uh, quote unquote from him, died an early death. Of, and why he um, didn't? Um, he wasn't at the test, and many of them were, um, and uh, you know, luck. And I, I, I've interviewed uh, workers at the Hunters Point shipyard, and, and they're actually uh, going to develop Hunters Point and put housing on Hunters Point. Uh, I, and they're called brownfields, these contaminated yeah, yeah. sites. They, they, they Congress, developers paid Congress people to pass a law saying brownfield that the, 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 the private developer will clean up these sites. They'll be okay to be developed. Well, it turns out many of these sites haven't been cleaned up. The workers get sick on them. In Downey, California, the contamination of uh, Downey uh, um, uh, Studios, workers, they even, Kaiser even built a hospital on this contaminated uh, dump site in Downey, California. So people are getting sick. Workers are getting sick at that hospital. And I interviewed one worker at Hunter's Point. His name is Tom Campbell. He was a machinist who was told to carry out these uh, barrels of material, and he got cancer on his stomach from the radioactive material that was, that was at, at Hunter's Point. So, I mean, this is endemic. It's all over the place. I mean, this cancer, and workers are being contaminated, communities being contaminated. Right here in San Francisco, they're saying that these places can be developed. We don't have a speaker from Hunter's Point, but I'm sure they are having radioactive problems and all kinds of problems as a result of the con serious contamination. I mean, they uh, uh, brush down the ships, they blast the ships, all that dust is all over from the atomic blast. So once it's there, it's, it's there. All kinds of things. So I mean these are these are highly contaminated areas. And the idea that you can redevelop the area, which is what's being put forward in the brownfield sites, is impossible because to properly clean it up would take billions, which a developer is not going to spend. But they are put back into use and for a profit and they buy the land for pennies on a dollar. And that's are we over time? Yeah, we're on a little time. So one more question. Uh, I guess it's uh, USS Reagan. Was that the ship? USS Reagan. <clears throat> it was heading toward the plume. A big plume hit a Japanese ship directly. USS Reagan sent a helicopter over. <clears throat> Sailors came back and highly radioactive shoes. I don't know what happened to the Japanese ship. Well, the, the, one of the <clears throat> issues of, of Japan and what happened with the explosions, the dirty bombs that went off, is that... Uh, the Japanese government asked the U.S. government where these plumes were going. The U.S. government monitors all this stuff worldwide. I mean, they know everything that's going on as far as nuclear material or, or plumes. They monitor the plumes. So the, Japanese, the U.S. government told the Japanese government where the plumes were after the explosion. Then the Japanese government said, can we release this information? And the U.S. government said, you can release this information for protection of the public. The Japanese government never told the Japanese people where these plumes were going. So the woman that we talked to, people took their children in to escape into the plumes because they were not being informed where the plumes were. The government refused to tell the people where the plumes were. So that's why this mother, we interviewed people in Japan, mothers, that they were escaping and they went right into a plume. And they, they, weren't, they weren't told that this plume was there. So the government directed people. Well, I don't know. Well, exactly. I, don't, I don't know about directing, but all, all, I do know that, that they knew where the plumes were. The U.S. government told where the plumes were. They, got, they had permission to, to tell people where the plumes were. They didn't do that. And the, the big reason is they did not want to panic, and they didn't want people to know 
how dangerous these explosions were. And they still continue to tell them, it's okay, don't worry. I mean, the repression, and you saw the film, the amount of repression in Japan, not physical necessarily, although there's been arrest of people in Osaka who have been protesting against the burning of rubble, nuclear waste. They want each of the prefectures or states in Japan to burn rubble, nuclear waste rubble. They're telling them, burn this rubble, we'll give you some money. So there's an opposition to that in Japan of burning the waste rubble. They're arresting people who are publicizing against burning the nuclear waste rubble in Japan. <coughs> but the repression in Japan, the silence, don't raise these issues. These mothers that spoke uh, were told they, they raised some issues in a, 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 like a, a meeting of parents, and, they, and one of the parents said, well, my, father, my husband works for TEPCO or uh, Tohoku. I don't want to talk about that. In other words, their whole business is one of, you know, the business of the nuclear industry and the, and the energy industry. So there's a, a pressure to be silent and not even talk about what's going on as far as the radioactive contamination. So uh, let's, quick, because we're running into... Uh, I read a story about an attorney who lives near Fukushima who had to evacuate his office and his practice was ruined. And so he was suing Bethel. Uh, they said they're not responsible for radioactivity beyond the plant. Wow. Well, I mean, there's there's a lawsuit. There's actually a lawsuit to say that they should be prosecuted criminally because of what they did at TEPCO. But the problem is the government of Japan is not interested, which owns controls TEPCO, is not interested. And uh, we have these circumstances where in schools they were quote unquote decontaminating schools. They were removing the top layer of soil in these uh, schools, and 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 people said, well, can you take these bags? bags of decontaminated soil. And they said, no, we, we're not going to take the bags. You have to leave them to the side of the school, wow. on the school grounds, while your kids are told to go back to school. And my question so, has to do with the responsibility of the consequences of the If it was in the United States? In the United States, the, there, according to the Atomic Energy Act, there is limited liability on the behalf for the private contractor who owns the nuclear plants. And they got, I think it's about $500 million, which in today's world is very little, uh, considering a nuclear accident. Beyond that, the federal government takes care of the financial liability. Okay. You had a question that for a long time. Well, it was, it was just related to the, um, the medical care. If, in, if I remember right, the 2004 budget uh, Bush actually uh, cut the budget for health care for the <laughs> nuclear workers. And so you kind of raised it, so it sort of got answered, uh, that it's, if, if you've been subject to you know, radioactive uh, contamination in your workplace, especially at Hanford and these top secret facilities, it's against the law for you to go to another doctor because you're disclosing your, your work environment. And so for Bush to have cut the budget meant that he was firing the doctors and destroying their health care system, even in-house system. So I was just going to raise that, but as an adjunct to that, it was, uh, are you keeping track of the dirty doctors, the company doctors, and maybe there's a way we could get the AMA to yank their licenses? That's a good question. I mean, I, I don't know. In terms of, you know, there's really three sets here. There's the Department of Energy's doctors, then there's the Department of Labor's doctors, who are supposed to be um, more removed from the complex. And then there's generally people's, if you're at Livermore Lab, you have, there's a doctor on site, but then your health care is through Kaiser. But they have specially trained uh, doctors at Kaiser Livermore to deal with right. workers from Livermore Lab. But, so they're kind of a third branch. Um, I always recommend my clients go see an independent doctor and pay for it out of pocket. Okay. Well, what do you think of that program? You said you, you can go to Kaiser. You know, former workers, they can uh, get a free physical like every three years? Yes. Because I just had a physical, yeah. and I had one three years ago because I did work about a year at the lab, too. Yeah, the former worker screening Yeah, what do you think of that program? Um, it's not the best. 
Better than nothing. Though. Better than nothing. And they look, think about General Electric and the rest of the new plants in the yeah. in the United States and all these workers that work temporary. Yeah. Do they get physicals or anything? Right, they don't. And the, None of them do. the attorney, the mm -hmm. doctors at, at Kaiser, for example, mm -hmm. are trained in things like beryllium disease, right, which right. is very specific to right. only nuclear workers. People don't get beryllium disease elsewhere because beryllium is really only used in the nuclear weapons complex and world. Well, that came um, from your goes, machine shops there. Yeah, and it goes misdiagnosed if those same workers were to go anywhere else they would think it was asbestosis or something else and it'd be treated wrong incorrectly and misdiagnosed so the fact that we have the screening program is really important for things like that however there's other things for example i have a worker who has something called radio or uh, osteoradionecrosis which is a disease that's only been found in survivors of hiroshima actually um, people who survived Hiroshima 10 or 15 years later, the tops of their skulls decayed. Wow. And it, it was found that they got really heavy doses of radiation on the tops of their heads if they were outside at the bomb blast or like on the side of their face or something. And it causes exactly what it sounds like, osteonecrosis. It causes your bones to decay. He was working in a glove box at Sandia Lab, um, and he uh, a few times had his hands in his glove box working with tritium, which is radioactive hydrogen, took his hands out of the glove box, a minute would go by and the alarm in, the, off in his room would go off because something was escaping the glove box. Turns out his gloves had holes in them. And so while his hands were in the gloves, nothing was escaping, but his hands were getting exposed on his fingertips. So all of his fingertips uh, had both this bone decay called osteoradionecrosis. It's super rare. Even these doctors at Kaiser had no idea what it was. And he had to go see a specialist on his own dime somewhere else um, who finally, who knew about these studies from Hiroshima and said that is osteoradionecrosis. Um, and so there's so many things that can happen from radi radiation exposure, like Steve said, that they go misdiagnosed, and even at these specialized places, they don't necessarily diagnose it. Yeah, well, uh, last point, on the video, we didn't bring it up, but the after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, the doctors there, since they wanted to limit liability, were not properly treating people. Mm -hmm. So what people had to do is set up their own clinics to treat themselves after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And, and that now is the experience in Fukushima. People are being told by the doctors, don't worry, we're not gonna talk about it. They're not taking care of the people. So, I mean, it, it, it repeats itself, this whole process. So, I wanna thank Scott for coming. And so, everyone, uh, the other speakers, uh, Barbara and Dan.